Hello, students. Okay, so today we are going to deal with the doctrine of insurable interest. So what is this insurable interest? In any insurance contract, the concept of insurable interest has to be established. Okay, so let us see in this chapter, what is this insurable interest and how important it is in an insurance contract? Now, as you can see here on the slide, it says that an insurable interest is an essential element in the contract of insurance and to be, for it to be considered valid apart from other general elements is the element of insurable interest. So the fundamental principle that revolves around insurance contracts is the principle of insurable interest. Now, in simple terms, insurable interest means it is the interest that a person would have in something such as, say, um, a property that has to be insured or a car that has to be insured. So the interest that a person has to you know, protect that particular property and just in case something gets wrong with that property or the property is harmed, then the person would suffer a loss in case the property is destroyed. So this is um, insurable interest. That means for an insurance contract to be valid, the concept of insurable interest has to be established. So thereby it says that the fundamental principle that revolves around insurance contracts is the principle of insurable interest. So this interest specifically is pertaining to the subject matter of insurance. Now it implies that a specific person, body or a corporate must have some interest in the subject matter of insurance. Now, for example, you are the car owner, okay? And you are investing in auto insurance, why? Because you have a direct insurable interest in that vehicle. You are the owner of the vehicle. You desire that the vehicle is protected against accident, against fire or whatever. So you desire that it is protected. Why? Because you are the owner. So this establishes that you have a direct insurable interest in the motor vehicle that you have insured with the insurance company. So therefore, to have an insurable interest in something would mean that the person seeking the insurance policy would really suffer a loss if that insured person or property were to be harmed, lost, or damaged. Furthermore, that the person would receive some financial benefit from that insured person or property's continued existence. Is it clear? Next is, now, inferring on the insurable interest in an application for insurance or a claim helps in, one, prevention of random issue of insurance, and two, prevention of speculation of risks involved. Now, what is the definition of insurable interest? One, as per Collins Dictionary of Law, it says that a person has such an interest in property or in life of a person if damage or destruction of the property or death of the person would expose him to a pecuniary loss or liability. That means it would expose the person to a financial loss or a liability. So in simple terms, we would say that insurable interest is an integral part, is an essential part of an insurance contract. That means a person should have a kind of a relationship to the object or the person that is, you know, to be insured. Um, there has to be some kind of proprietary right or interest in a particular property. And in case uh, there is some damage or harm caused to that particular property, that means it, there would be a direct nexus or a direct harm that would be caused to the person who is insuring the particular property. So this is insurable interest. So your, I remember your assignment is on this particular concept that needs to be established 
in the case that I had given you. And so you will have to also mention the concept of insurable interest. So the question come, comes, who has an insurable interest? So I gave you an example saying that you are the owner of the car. You are purchasing an insurance policy and saying that I will pay premium for X number of years for the protection that would be given by the insurance company against all risks. And should there be any damage, then the insurance company would you know, indemnify the loss. Last time we learned about the principle of indemnity so that it would cover the loss, would indemnify the loss that has occurred to the owner of the car. So who has an insurable interest is a matter of question. So any person or corporate body or an entity has an insurable interest in any item event or action person when the damage or loss of the object property would cause a, fin a direct financial loss or hardship to the person who has insured the particular property or object. So now, generally speaking, there are, you know, three types of risks that are insurable, say liability risk, personal risk, and property risk. And when you talk about insurable interest, you could call it as contractual insurable interest or statutory insurable interest. Statutory means by law. So insurance, therefore, is inferred bearing in mind the ascertainment of the factor of risk. I'm repeating, when you're talking about insurance, you're talking about covering the risk to the individual, right? Now, also, we are talking about the concept of insurable interest. Coming back to the example I gave you, you are the owner of a car. You are insuring the car with the insurance company. That means you are the owner of the car. You are insuring it with the insurance company. That means you have an insurable interest in the car. That implies, in, should there be any loss and damage to the car, it would affect you. It would cause you financial loss. So therefore, you can say that you have an insurable interest in the car. There is a direct relationship between you, the car, and the risk. Right? So. Insurance contracts normally deal with coverage of risks, okay? And for that, the person that is the insurer must have an insurable interest in the property, object, entity, or a person, whatever it may be, depending upon the type of insurance it is, that the person seeks coverage of that particular risk. So now this is evaluated when during the underwriting process. Normally in insurance, uh, you know, the insurance company has a process called as the underwriting process where they would study the subject matter of the, the, the object of insurance and then evaluate it and then accordingly come up with the premiums and so on. So this is evaluated during the underwriting process to ensure that there is a direct relationship or a direct nexus between the person who is insuring the object or property, whatever it may be, and the, sub and the subject matter of insurance. So what would be examined here is a person who would be exposed to a loss, financial loss, in case of some harm that may be caused to the subject matter of insurance. So insurable interest could also be disappeared among, upon examining the nexus of the relationship between the insured and the event as well as the subject matter involved and then assuming the occurrence of the event to calculatively ascertain the substantial loss or injury to the insured. Now, an owner of goods or an owner of goods will prima facie or will directly have an insurable interest in the goods or the property insured. However, the property and or the ownership may change with the passage of time during the subsistence of the insurance contract. Now, in such an event, it gets relatively cumbersome or tiresome, you know, to pinpoint who the owner of the good is at the time of loss or claim. So now here, there is a great deal that hinges upon any subsequent contract terms pertaining to sale 
or even devolution of property. So therefore we could say that insurable interest is thus at the heart of all insurance policies connecting the insured and the owner of the policy or establishing the relationship between the insured and the owner of the policy. So insurable interest can be an object or a person which if damaged or destroyed or if it expires would result in financial hardship for the one contracting the policy or the policy holder. There is an interesting case here in Lucina versus Crawford uh, and the citation is HL 1806. There was just Justice Lawrence who observed in the case in the pursuit of advising the lordships in that particular case. He said that a man is interested in a thing to whom advantage may arise or prejudice happen from the circumstances which may attend to it and whom it imports and its conditions as to safety or other quality should continue. Now, interest that not, does not necessarily imply a right to the whole or part of the thing, nor necessarily and exclusively that which may be the subject of privation, but having some relation to or concerning the subject of the insurance, which relation or concern by the happening of the perils, that is the risks insured against, may be so affected as to produce a damage, detriment or prejudice to the person insuring. That means there has to be some kind of a harm that is caused to the person who is seeking the insurance policy or who is insuring the particular product or object or property or whatever it may be. And there a man is so circumstanced with respect to matters exposed to certain risks or dangers as to have a moral certainty of advantage or benefit, but for those risks or dangers, he may be said to be interested in the safety of the thing. To be interested in the preservation of a thing is to be so circumstanced with respect to it as to have benefit from its existence, prejudice from its destruction. So the property of a thing and the interest divisible from it may be very different. Of the first, the price is generally the measure, but by interest in a thing, every benefit and advantage arising out of or depending on such thing may be considered as being comprehended. So this is what Justice Lawrence said. He tried to establish the nexus or the relationship between the object that is insured and the person who is insuring that particular object or property and saying that there has to be a direct relationship between the insurer and the object that is insured so much so that in case there is any harm or damage caused to the object that is insured, the person who's insuring would be directly affected. Now, in Minster Insurance Company Limited and Easy Parker and Company Limited, Moon Aka, here there was an insurance policy which was taken for a motor yacht, Moon Aka, which was which actually belonged to one Mr. Sharp. Now listen carefully, this case law is important for you, not only examination point of view, but also for the assignment that is given to you. I'm repeating, this particular case law is important even for the assignment that is given to you. So now in Minster Insurance Company's case, insurance policy was taken for a motor yacht, Muneka, which, was, which actually belonged to one Mr. Sharp. So there was a yacht that belonged to Mr. Sharp. But for the purpose of tax, a company called Rohrer Investments in Gibraltar was registered as the owner of Munaika. So Mr. Sharp was then given the power of attorney by the registered company to sail and manage the, the vessel. And he was also named as the assured in the contract of insurance. So during the policy, whilst the single crewman employed on board Moonacre was away, the yacht caught fire at her moorings and become, became a constructive total loss. When the assured Mr. Sharp sought to recover and claim the policy, the insurers MIC, that is a Minster Insurance Company Limited, declined payment on the grounds inter alia that Mr. Sharp did not possess any insurable interest in Moonacre. 
but the court held that Mr. Sharp indeed did, in fact, have an insurable interest in the yacht. Why? Because it belonged to him. So there was a direct nexus established between Mr. Sharp and it is said that he had an insurable interest in the yacht. So this is an important case law for you for your assignment. Now, for an insurable interest to exist, it is not always that ownership that matters, but what matters is the actual link or the relationship between the insured and the risk insured against. In yet another case, in Bertu Camilleri versus Harold Bartley, the court held that for insurable interest to exist, it's not necessary that there has to be absolute ownership always, which is required, but the existence of a relationship between the person insured and the thing which could be adversely affected by the happening of the risk insured against. Even this is an important case law for you, uh, for your assignment, you can quote this as well. Now talking about life insurance policy, now, the factor or the concept of insurable interest would be determined at the time of purchase of the policy. Here, the one who seeks the policy or contracts the policy must have an insurable interest in the life of the insured. Now, in case the person contracting the policy is not the beneficiary, then the beneficiary named in the contract will have to express the nexus between the purchaser of the policy and the beneficiary to evidence insurable interest and to prove that upon the demise of the insured, the surviving person named in would be exposed to the loss. So therefore, in case of insurance policy, the following persons could be considered to have an insurable interest. One, the person who purchases the insurance policy, probably for himself, for his own life. And two, the direct dependents by blood or marriage, uh, like spouse or children, grandchildren, adopted children. So it's not necessarily the person. So in case a person, you know, expires, so then it would go directly to the direct dependents by blood or marriage, uh, children, grandchildren, or adopted children. So this is something distinct when it comes to, uh, you know, uh, life insurance policy. And the question of continued existence. In the case of Bartolo Uturner's Limited versus Middlesea Insurance, the court observed that an insurable interest exists when the insured may be set to benefit by the continued existence of the property or life insured and will suffer a loss by reason of its damage or destruction. Now, in case of key man life insurance or business life insurance, the person who's insured who may be regarded as a key person in business and in case of sudden demise of such an individual the business may be exposed to a risk or loss therefore a business may have an insurable interest in its c suit officers talking about creditors companies banks or loaning institutions now they may secure the debtors with a life insurance policy with the absolute consent from such debtors of course and the policy sought will be equal to the amount owed. So therefore, some of the considerations when it comes to insurable interest or talking about the nature of insurable interest, how would you determine the nature of insurable interest or what are the factors revolving the concept of insurable interest? One, insurable interest must be capable of being legally enforced. It must be lawful and not legal. Again, you can write this point as well, these points as well in your assignment. Insurable interests must be capable of being legally enforced. It must be lawful and not illegal. Insurable interests must not be opposed to public policy. It must be capable of calculating it in pecuniary terms. Sentimental factors or love and affection cannot be always construed as insurable interest. Now, the relationship between the insured, the subject matter, and the policyholder is examined and not always mere ownership. Now, the factor of insurable interest varies with the type of insurance. It differs with the type of insurance. 
insurable interest may be present at the time of taking the policy, but may frizzle out subsequently as in life insurance policy. So therefore, contractual provision to that extent must be secured as to the existence at the time of securing the policy and to be interpreted as that it may or may not exist at the time of claim. Example, where a husband may secure a life insurance policy for his wife, and then after some years, he divorces her and then she dies. So the husband will be able to claim, obviously. Now, to just uh, you know, substantiate this point, let us go through the case of Griffith versus Fleming. So in this case, Griffith and his wife each signed a proposal form for a joint life insurance policy on their lives for 500 pounds. And both contributed towards the premium, both the husband and wife. So after the policy was taken, the wife committed suicide and the husband claimed the sum assured. So the insurer alleged, that is the insurance company, they alleged that at the time of taking the policy, the husband had no insurable interest in his wife, wife's life as required by the Life Assurance Act 1774. But the court through, uh, you know, uh, Justice Vaughan Williams held that the husband has indeed an interest in his wife's life, which ought to be presumed, and that it is unnecessary to go into evidence to show any financial interest, pecuniary interest, and financial interest of the husband. Next in property insurance, marine insurance, insurable interest must exist at all times till the time of actual possession of the property. So therefore, what is this insurable interest? So it is an interest that the, insur the, the insured or the person has in something such as a particular property or probably an individual when it comes to life insurance, which means that the person would suffer a loss should that property or individual, in case it's a life insurance policy individual, so in case an individual is harmed. So therefore, in insurance law, you can only buy insurance policy for something or someone in which you have an insurable interest. Right? I hope this concept is clear. Any questions? Please write your names in the chat box for me to just note your attendance, please. Any questions? Okay, so, okay, so uh, since you do not have any questions, so we'll wind up with this class. And uh, next class, we will do chapter four. Get ready with your assignments. Um, I might extend the date just by a day or two, not more, of course. Yes, Ruvida, tell me. Uh, uh, today, today, lesson was... So well was uh, much interesting and there is a lot of information. I feel like uh, we could just uh, re-modify our assignment. Uh, do we have this uh, ability to modify it? If yeah, 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 please, please, please. You can go ahead and modify it. No problem. I will extend Thank the date for you because uh, see, my interest is also that you submit the best assignment. I can extend it for you by one week. Okay. Thank you so much. Yeah, you're welcome. Okay. So that's it, students. See you next class. I'll extend the assignment by one week. Um, so I have recorded the attendance. Abdul Rahman, Abdullahi, Ali Omar, Amin, Mubarak, Mustaf, Ravida, Shusain, and Kaur Yaqub. Okay, sounds good. So see you next class and all the best. For your assignments again, I will just try to you know extend the date. Take care. Bye bye.